Former President Donald Trump said yesterday that he would not be participating in another U.S. presidential debate with Vice President Kamala Harris. The two face off on Tuesday in their first ever debate, and it was heated. She has a plan to confiscate everybody's gun. Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. The way it will end is we need a ceasefire deal and we need the hostages out. She hates Israel. She wouldn't even meet with Netanyahu when he went to Congress to make a very important speech. If Donald Trump were president, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv right now. People start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom. People don't leave my rallies. We have the biggest rallies. We have millions of people pouring into our country. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. <laughs> you talk about extreme. <laughs> Daniel Dale is a reporter for CNN, and he fact-checked Tuesday's debate, and he joins us now. Daniel Dale, welcome to Power in Politics. Thank you very much. Let's talk about what you did uh, on the night of the debate. You counted 33 lies, as you called them, by Donald Trump over the 90-minute debate on Tuesday. Give us some context on that. H how do you get to that number, and, and how does that compare to what you've seen in the past? Uh, I'll take the second one first. It is similar to what we've seen in the past. Every debate that I've fact-checked involving Donald Trump has involved a huge disparity in terms of the number of false claims he has made versus the number his opponent has made. So this uh, disparity was bigger than the one we saw uh, at the debate uh, between him and Biden. Uh, mm -hmm. Biden, I, I counted at least nine false claims, uh, but Trump's 30-plus number was common for him. How do we get to it? Well, thankfully, at CNN, uh, we have... Uh, resources in the newsroom, and we assemble a big team. Uh, so it's not just me. It's a bunch of beat reporters with expertise in everything from national security to immigration to the environment. And we're frantically typing, sometimes frantically reaching out to experts on debate night and doing what reporters do, trying to assess whether the claims were true or not. Something that helps with Donald Trump is that he makes the same false claims over and over and over again. Um, and so many of them I have basically or literally pre-written, you know, because I'd run these exact same fact checks over sometimes years. Okay, because that's interesting, because I, I know when I first became aware of you as the Donald Trump fact checker, you were still working for the Toronto Star, and you were doing it by yourself in real time, sort of, on Twitter. And now here you are the face of it on, on one of the biggest news organizations in the world, but you've got the backing of a whole team. Like, I mean, how, how many people are we talking about here that it takes to be able to mount this real time fact checking uh, on such a big stage and such a big election? It's, it's a bunch. I don't even know the exact number. I think we had more than a dozen people involved. Right. They're, all, they're all critical. I think especially with the, the, the person involved who is not Donald Trump. So I think the team will be especially instrumental when we get to the VP debate, mm -hmm. um, because I don't have a big database of fact checks on Tim Walls or J.D. Vance. With Trump, uh, I have a massive <laughs> database because I've been doing this since 2016. And I just wrote a piece uh, the other week. L literally, Trump has been telling some of the same lies since 2016, many of them since 2020, almost word for word. And so it's very hard to do it in real time when he introduces a claim because, of course, you have to research it. You can't get it right. wrong. But when he tells it for literally the 100th time or, you know, eight years later, uh, it's pretty pretty easy to do it fast. Okay, so 33 for Donald Trump. I, th I think when I saw you initially on debate, and it was just one, I think, for Kamala Harris. Is is that where the final tally was? Where are we? I said I said at least one. I think I'd, I'd now say uh, at least two, and I think you could you could argue maybe three. I'd probably put it at at, at least two. Okay, so you, she's doubled the amount of false claims. I, I mean, but like, uh, you know, in, in politics, uh, Daniel, there's spin and there's misrepresentation and then there's an outright lie. So like, yeah. how do you categorize those? Because I've seen you come out and say, this is a lie. You, you call what, you, sometimes you use big adjectives. How do you d decide to grade them all and rank them all? It's, let's be honest, there's some subjectivity here. So, for example, with Vice President Harris, I would say at least two false claims, but there were some other statements I'd call misleading, mm. others I'd say lacking in context. I think um, I try to be generous to everyone I fact check. Uh, Trump critics might not say, uh, sorry, Trump supporters might not say I'm especially generous to him, but I feel like I am. Um, if, if there is some doubt about whether, you know, maybe perhaps there's some uh, defense of some claim, even if most people are saying it's nonsense, well, you could frame it this way or that way, I might not call it false. I might say misleading or lacking in context. And so I'm constantly trying to uh, hold political leaders accountable, but right. also um, give them the benefit of the doubt. Think, have kind of a devil's advocate in my head, thinking, how would a smart critic attack 
uh, this fact check if I called it false and kind of re responding to that that imaginary person as they go about this work. No, that, that makes a ton of sense, especially with some that are sort of in that gray area, whether it's an exaggeration or an outright lie. But Daniel, what, what goes through your head when he says they're eating the cats, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the pets in Springfield? Uh, I think, you know, I, when you're in the moment, I like, I just, I, I would just like, I prepared for that. Uh, I think my thought was, okay, he, he did it and I have an item for this. Mm. Um, and so, uh, a lot of what I do in advance of the debate is trying to kind of, uh, conduct an imaginary debate in my head. Okay. What are these candidates likely to say? And I realized, I forget if it was the morning of the debate or the night before, Hey, Trump is probably going to mention the cats thing. Um, and he did. I think actually my, one of my thoughts in the moment was, oh, goodness, he introduced dogs to this because uh, <laughs> the whole nonsense, you know, rumor that started on Facebook, the whole discussion was about cats. Uh, one thing we see with Donald Trump is that he's usually not content to repeat other people's uh, exaggeration or false claim. He has to make it bigger. So if someone is saying, I don't know, uh, we have near record inflation, he'll say, uh, it's record inflation. It's the worst in a hundred years, you know, and so he he made it bigger in typical form. So, you know, this is obviously, it's an important function. It's a difficult thing to do in real time, but also with this extremely polarized and uh, political environment, especially in the U.S., increasingly here in Canada, and, and more and more, Daniel, people are living kind of in their own reality that's, that's built by social media. There's a lot of pushback when someone comes in and says, this is a lie, this isn't true. And, and I would imagine you get some, some pretty tough responses to it. I mean, how difficult is it in the current U.S. political environment to be so public in such a role where you, you got to call these balls and strikes and people won't like the ump? I think it's fine. I've I've come to find it fine. I think one thing about the criticism these days is that, you know, in the old days, the newsrooms, people used to get nasty letters, like in the actual mail, and then it became nasty emails where they mm. pop up in your inbox. Now it's mostly nasty tweets. And yeah. I found that if you, if you don't check them, it's like they don't they don't exist. I know that some reporters don't have the luxury of it. Uh, you know, they're getting actual threats or truly disgusting things. But if, if I have hundreds of people just being like, you're, you know, you're biased, or sometimes even go home to Canada, uh, it doesn't bother me. You know, I'm I'm confident in my judgment. I, you know, again, we have a team. I've been doing, you know, extensive research on this stuff for a long time. Uh, sometimes there is good faith criticism. I'll get an email or mm -hmm. even a tweet saying, you, you got this wrong and here's why. And I'll listen to that. I'm not like pigheaded about this thinking I have all the answers or I'm going to be perfect. But I think for the most part, the, the toxic nonsense, uh, my advice to fellow journalists would be, you know, just ignore it as much as you can. And sometimes it's like it's not happening at all. I think increasingly, Daniel, th there's an appetite in the public for more of what you do. Like certainly us here at the CBC, CTV Global, everybody in Canada want to see more sort of real time fact checking, more debunking of misinformation. It is resource intensive, as you say, and, and like we're a big organization, but we're not CNN, right, in, in terms of size and scale. How important do you think it is, though, with the way the social media misinformation ecosystem is, is growing right now that more and more resources are just dedicated to this kind of thing? I think it's critical and, and kind of my, my mini, uh, something I say whenever I do talks about this stuff or interviews is that um, it's great that I have a job as like the fact check guy. It's cool to be at CNN as a Canadian, but I don't think that news organizations need to have, you know, a dedicated fact checker to do fact checking. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that uh, fact checking should be treated as kind of like a, a Super Bowl model where like you do fact checking on the big debate night uh, and then the rest of the year you don't. I think uh, it should be treated as a core part of every reporter, every anchor, every journalist's mission. You know, this is part of what you do every day. So any story, you know, when you're quoting a politician, if something in that quote is wrong, if you have to include it, you should be pointing that out. And something else I, I try to emphasize is that I don't think that's bias. You're going to get people calling you biased, but I think a, a core part of our job is to inform people and to tell people what's true and not. And so you can do that in, in a news story. And it doesn't mean you, you have to be a jerk, a jerk about it. You know, you don't have to grandstand. You don't have to call attention to yourself. There are very, you know, subtle, polite, professional, respectful ways of pointing out that that things are not true. And so I, I really encourage people in any country, you know, if you're a reporter, you're an anchor, whatever, like make this part of your day-to-day -day mission. But, but that's a key final point and a good spot to, to end on because you, that you are accused of bias increasingly. Not you, I mean the, our profession. You're accused of bias. You're accused of having an agenda. You're accused of being partisan. And there's a reluctance baked into a lot of people, particularly younger reporters maybe and less experienced reporters to do it. 
because they don't want to be put in the crosshairs by the people they're fact checking. Any last bits of advice on, on how people should approach that? It's 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 hard. I mean, especially uh, in the era of like, you know, social media is important to young people. Uh, people on social media have the ability to kind of gang up on you and flood your flood your mentions. Um, I think that, uh, unfortunately, being a reporter has often required having a thick skin uh, and, and that's manifested itself in various different ways. Now it's often a thick skin about criticism. So don't don't tune out criticism completely because it'll make you better. You will get things wrong. But um, as long as you're doing the research, you're you're putting the work in, you're making sure you're being fair to all sides, um, you know, trust your own gut, trust your own voice. And if people are calling you names, that's that's not especially important. Daniel, I uh, appreciate the time. I counted zero false statements in our conversation. So so good for oh, you, you getting thank through it. <laughs> That's CNN reporter, CNN reporter, fact checker, and good Canadian boy, Daniel Dale. Thanks so much, man. Good to talk to you. You too. We have millions of people pouring into our country. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. <laughs> you talk about extreme. <laughs> Okay, so Donald Trump repeated that bizarre piece of misinformation at this week's U.S. presidential debate, saying Haitian immigrants have been hunting and eating pet cats and dogs in Springfield, Ohio. Springfield's a Midwestern town that's become the center of a misinformation campaign about immigrants in America, home to upwards of about 20,000 Haitians who have arrived in recent years, at least according to city officials. The false claims were quickly amplified with AI-generated memes. It's a misinformation campaign that's had a nasty fallout for a visible and vulnerable population. Depicting Haitian immigrants as those who are uh, consuming or eating pets, dogs or cats, are not only false, but they are racist, despicable, and dangerous. I have a pet. I love my Bella. And so you, you sit there and you say, this is what my country, my American country, has become. Just today, two elementary schools in Springfield were closed because of bomb threats, prompting President Biden to speak out. Community that's under attack in our country right now. Simply wrong. There's no place in America. This has to stop what he's doing. Miriam Jordan is a national immigration correspondent for The New York Times and has been closely following the story of Springfield, Ohio, long before it became a topic in the debate. Miriam, it's good to meet you. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you for having me. You've been in Springfield covering immigration there like well before the pet eating comments even became a thing. I mean, how did Springfield, Ohio come to the center of such a politicized debate in America? Well, uh, Springfield, Ohio is a small town um, in the middle of America that had been struggling to fill jobs after it managed to attract new businesses to the area. And word got out to the immigrant community, um, especially Haitians, that there were jobs, um, housing that was affordable, and you know that they would be trained and welcomed there. So they went in very large numbers um, starting after the pandemic and have continued to arrive since then. So, so they arrived in large numbers, somewhere between 12 and 20,000, I think is the range that, that I saw in, in your reporting. But you know, based on what you're telling us and, 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 and PBS and others who have gone there, They've showed up, they've taken jobs in factories, they're doing sort of those working class jobs where there was a shortage of skilled workers there. They are not a problem in the community beyond the fact that the surge in population growth kind of overwhelms some of the social and housing infrastructure in the community. Is, is that a fair assessment of the Haitians' role in Springfield, Ohio? Yes, I mean, the truth is that at the same time as the Haitians have helped revitalize the city and the community, they have also um, somewhat overwhelmed um, certain services. Mm. For instance, the publicly subsidized health clinic in town, you know, that allotted on average 15 minutes per um, appointment is now seeing appointments stretch to 45 minutes or so because of the language barriers. It's right. had to invest in interpreters and, uh, you know, this has made it difficult to um, serve all the clientele that's seeking medical care. 
Um, rents have gone up because when you have four individual Haitian men renting a two bedroom apartment, they can probably pay more than a single American family with one breadwinner, right? For right. four people earning money versus one person. So there have been these kind of growing pains, and there has been some resentment building among some of the Springfield residents about the influx as a result. Okay, so th we're going through a similar thing in Canada where immigration numbers have been high, there's not enough doctors, there aren't necessarily enough jobs, and there's certainly not enough housing. And it, it has led to like shocks through the economy. But where did this notion that Haitians are stealing and eating household pets or geese from a park, I mean, where did that even come from, let alone end up in a US presidential debate? Right. That's that was like kind of the strange and huge turning point that happened basically in the last few days. Um, you know, it's it's hard to to know exactly where and how it started. But from what I have gathered from my reporting, um, you know, someone stood up at a city commission meeting in Springfield and said something to the effect of, you know, Haitians stealing, um, you know, animals um, and eating them. And, um, you know, someone else found video of some woman in another Ohio city who was not even a Haitian who had gotten in trouble because she um, su supposedly, you know, slaughtered a cat for consumption. And before we knew it, uh, this was being picked up by right wing media and, um, you know, swirling on um, social networks and landed in the laps of politicians like J.D. Vance, the vice presidential running mate of Donald Trump and even Donald Trump's campaign itself. Right, because because we saw J.D. Vance tweeting about it. Uh, we saw him talking about it after Trump said it in the debate. I watched on CNN as he doubled down on it and said that people in his constituency were calling him and telling him about these reports. But you've been there. I mean, did this ever come across? Did you ever come across this when you were reporting on the reality of Springfield, Ohio? I, I mean, what, what can you tell us about your experience there? Um I mean, during the days when I visited Springfield, Ohio, I did not hear or see anything um, that would suggest that Haitians are engaging in, um, you know, uh, pet snatching um, activities um, to consume them for, you know, lunch or dinner. Um, I, you know, I, I, I met people who were very appreciative of the Haitians and the contributions that they're making to the economy, uh, enriching the culture, helping bolster enrollment in the schools. Um, and I met, you know, m many Haitians who are, who are very successful there now, um, for themselves buying homes, et cetera. It's interesting because, look, the memes are out there post the debate and we all kind of laugh at the absurdity of it and the fact that it's Springfield and the town in The Simpsons is Springfield. Um, you know, it, it, it lends itself to a lot of online material, but there's a real dark consequence to this, right, Miriam? Like we're seeing bomb threats, we're seeing schools shut down. I know there's a lot of Haitian kids in the schools now because of the population surge and we should point out these are people who are here legally. This is not like border jumping migrants. These are people who are in the United States with legal status to work. But I mean, what are the consequences of the former president, his campaign, and this right wing ecosystem fueling these false rumors on, on a visible and vulnerable population like the Haitians in Springfield? Well, as the mayor of Springfield told me just yesterday, his city is really hurting. And, you know, the level of disruption has only um, intensified um, since, you know, the, the Trump and the Vance campaigns began, you know, um, repeating these debunked rumors, these baseless rumors uh, about the eating of the pets and, you know, people like Ted Cruz, right, the Texas uh, mm. senator, you know, mocking, uh, mocking this whole situation. Um, on the ground, I'm hearing from, you know, uh, city officials, I'm hearing from, you know, resident students, and, you know, everybody is very concerned. They are, you know, today was the second consecutive day in which there were school closures following bomb threats that arrived by email. And 
we don't know where this is going to end. I mean, is it is it going to really explode um, or is it just going to die down? But for now, it's 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 gotten worse. There, there's one other point just to touch on with you, Miriam, before before we let you go. And I, I've got a 10 year old boy. I've got a seven year old boy. And I've been reading in your reporting about Nathan Clark, whose 11 year old boy, Aiden Clark, was killed. August of 2023, I believe it was, uh, when his school bus, uh, it was a car accident, a van driven by a Haitian immigrant on his way to work, it says he was blinded by the sun, collided with the bus, and, and Aiden w died uh, in the accident. This was a little over a year ago. Um, it is an accident, even though there was prosecution for um, involuntary manslaughter, I believe it was. The president and J.D. Vance have been, have been using this. They've been politicizing this, and the father Nathan Clark has had to come in to say, leave my son out of this. He, he doesn't blame the Haitian community for this. I mean, how is that fitting in to this whole dynamic? Because that seems to have been a flashpoint where people started to get angry or, or some resentment was directed towards the Haitian population. Right, that's exactly right. Um, about a year ago on the first day of school, um, a Haitian immigrant uh, who was driving a minivan um, rammed into the school bus. The school bus tipped over, and um, this boy, Aiden Clark, was ejected from the bus and died um, at the scene. Um, and that, I think, sort of triggered um, a lot of pent up um, anger or resentment to come to the fore. So, you know, people might have been noticing this large influx mm. and not been particularly comfortable with it. Um, suddenly, you know, the city is, you know, has descended into this grief and, you know, people start to speak out and air these, you know, grievances that they've had and a lot of ugly rhetoric um, comes out of it. Yeah, and, and, and I think uh, J.D. Vance has said that this uh, immigrant murdered this boy and, and, and Nathan Clark has had to say, just, just stop talking about it. Aiden's father um, felt compelled to attend the most recent city commission meeting in Springfield to express his dismay that his son was being used as, or that his son's death was being used as like a political tool um, by politicians to score points. Okay, uh, Miriam Jordan, uh, excellent reporting for there. I read a lot of it today. I want to thank you for joining us uh, here on Power and Politics. That's Miriam Jordan with the New York Times. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Bye.